Well, good morning, everyone. Happy Monday morning to you. Welcome back to Morning Musings. My name is Don K. Preston. I'm the president of Preterist Research Institute of Ardmore, Oklahoma, and this is my Morning Musings. Well, I hope you've been uh, staying cool. Uh, I tell you, this is July. It's not even August. And here in southern Oklahoma, we have had some truly brutal, I'm talking brutal, hot weather. Uh, last week, we encountered some temperatures of 117 degrees. I don't even know what the heat index was at that particular time. Uh, we have had a major cool down, though. I, I got to tell you, boy, this is amazing. We've gone from 117 and it's cooled down all the way to 104. How about that? <laughs> Marvelous, eh? <laughs> uh, yeah, with a heat index, index, by the way, of 107 and 108. So, yeah, this, uh, like I said, it's not even August. And here we are experiencing this kind of thing. I look out the window. My, uh, my yard is just brown. And um, we, we need rain. I mean, we need rain desperately. I, I, I got to tell you this. Just the other day, my doorbell rang, and I went to the door, and there were two catfish and a bass standing at the front door wanting a cup of water. I mean, that's how dry it is. Okay, that's my attempt at levity. I'm not a comedian, so that's the best I can do. Okay, well, <clears throat> I promised last Thursday that we would continue in Deuteronomy chapter 32, which is the Song of Moses. And I, I do want to reemphasize something that I said last week. And that is that when I quote scholars who say the Song of Moses is paradigmatic for New Testament eschatology, when I quote those scholars who say that Deuteronomy 32 is the roadmap for the ministry of Jesus and Paul and Peter and John. I am not quoting a single preterist, okay? I'm not quoting men who agree with the preterist paradigm. In fact, they disagree with it. And yet they say Deuteronomy 32 is absolutely paradigmatic. Scott McKnight, Richard Hayes, N.T. Wright. P.N.D. Uh, P. Walker, and other, other incredibly wonderful scholars. All of these men agree, and they have written to the effect that the Song of Moses is incredibly important for understanding the New Testament doctrine of eschatology. Now, why is this important? It is important, ladies and gentlemen, because <clears throat> Pardon me. As I have shared with you before, it is, it is taken for granted in the amillennial and in the postmillennial world. God was through with Israel at the cross. God removed the law of Moses at the cross, nailed it to the cross. Beginning with the ministry of Jesus, and particularly beginning with the day of Pentecost, God was now dealing with the new covenant Israel. God was now dealing with the church. This, this element of doctrine was and is so fundamentally important to the fellowship in which I was, in which I was raised, the churches of Christ, the amillennial world, that to, to challenge that view is within itself considered anathema. You just don't question whether or not the law and Israel as God's covenant people passed away at the cross. But here's a problem. Peter in Acts chapter 2, after the cross, when the law of Moses was supposedly done away, quoted and applied Deuteronomy 32 to what was happening that day. Paul, throughout the entirety of his epistles, not in every one of them, but in many of his epistles, 
Romans, Corinthians, quoted the Song of Moses and applied it to his generation. Peter, in his epistles, applied the song to his generation. John, in the book of Revelation, applied the song of Moses to the coming vindication of the martyrs, which was coming very, very soon. So it's important for you to realize that the New Testament writers absolutely had no idea they did not ascribe or subscribe to the view that God was through with Israel at the cross, that God was through with the old covenant at the cross. They knew nothing of such a doctrine. And I've had some debates on that very subject. I had a debate with Kurt Simmons some years ago on the passing of the law, the end of Torah. That book is available on my websites. I had a written formal debate with a Church of Christ minister by the name of Terry Denton, or Benton, excuse me. That debate is found on my website, donkpreston.com. I have had countless written exchanges with all millennialists, pardon me, on this very subject. Now, I've said all of that to bring us down to this. I have pointed out to you that Matthew chapter 25, 31 and following is based upon, taken from the prophecy of Joel chapter 2 and 3. It shall come to pass in the last days, I'll pour up my spirit upon all flesh, and in those days, last days, and at that time, the day of the Lord, I will gather all nations to judgment. Joel 3, 1 and 2. So here's the prophecy of Joel that sets the context for Matthew chapter 25, 31 and following. Well, Joel chapter 3, 21 foretold the coming vindication of the martyrs in the last days <coughs> at the great and terrible day of the Lord, which is the coming of Christ in Matthew 25, 31. I've shared with you that Isaiah chapter 2 through 4 is directly parallel, predicted the same identical things as Joel 2 and 3. It predicted the last days. It predicted the great and terrible day of the Lord. It predicted the vindication of the martyrs. And, this is critical, in Luke 23, 28 to 31, Jesus quoted directly from Isaiah chapter 2, 19 to 21, and applied it to the impending judgment of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. So you have Joel 2, Isaiah 2, and by the way, <laughs> these are not by any means all of the prophecies of the Old Testament predicting the last days and the vindication of the martyrs, okay? They're not, they're not all of the prophecies. So what I've done is then to investigate that Deuteronomy chapter 32, a prediction of the last days, Deuteronomy 31, 29, Moses said, I know that after my departure, after my death, you will become utterly corrupt, and I will tell you what shall befall you in the last days. Eschaton, or eschatu, to hemeron, in the last days from the Septuagint, of course. So Deuteronomy 32 is about what would happen, and listen to me, listen to me very, very carefully. Moses is emphatic. He is not predicting the end of world history. He is not predicting the end of time. He is not predicting the end of the Christian age. He says, I'm going to tell you, Israel, what shall befall you in the last days. Now, 
I want you to ask yourself a question. If God was through with Israel at the cross, as I was taught growing up, and which is still the dominant view in the amillennial and even the postmillennial view, if God was through with Israel at the cross, then why would there be any concern whatsoever with what would happen to Israel in the Christian age, which is identified as the last days. In other words, in the amillennial and, and the postmillennial world, the majority of commentators identify the Christian age that ostensibly began on Pentecost as the last days. But you see, in that paradigm, God was already through with Israel. Israel's last days had already come and gone. So let me ask you a question. If Israel's last days ended at the cross, <coughs> and if the Christian, i.e. last days, begin on Pentecost, and the Christian last days have nothing whatsoever to do with Israel, <coughs> pardon me, or the fulfillment of God's old covenant promises made to old covenant Israel, then why was Moses predicting what would happen to Israel in the last days? You see, there are not two last day, last days. <laughs> there is one eschatological last days. And Moses is talking about it in Deuteronomy 31, 29 and in Deuteronomy chapter 32. So with that platform, with that foundation, <coughs> if, actually since, if it can be established that Matthew chapter 25, 31 and following is actually based upon Deuteronomy 32, Deuteronomy 31 and 32, then that means that Matthew chapter 25, 31 and following is about nothing except the last days of Israel. It means that Matthew chapter 25 is not about some second coming of Christ at the end of time or the end of the Christian age. It means it was the coming of Christ in the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70 to bring an end to Israel's last days in fulfillment of Deuteronomy 32. Now, tomorrow I'm going to drive this home even more, okay? Uh, like I told you last week, I didn't originally intend to spend this much time on Deuteronomy 32 but I tell you, Deuteronomy 32 is so rich. I mean, it is absolutely phantasmagorical wonderful. It's critical for understanding the New Testament. In the meantime, thanks for joining me. I will see you on the flip side.